welcome. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family. And we are delighted that you've welcomed us into your home. We would love to hear from you, so please send us an email with a question or a comment to Jim and Joy at EWTN.com. And today, our guest again is Patrick O'Hearn. He is a husband and father and an editor at Tan Books. He's also the author of several books, including the book that we're sharing about today, The Parents of the Saints, The Hidden Heroes Behind Our Favorite Saints. And this great book is available at EWTNRC. Dot com. Well, and I would like to talk about, you know, we have 17 grandchildren, and we have uh, Natalie is the fourth oldest, third oldest, yeah. and um, Natalie is graduating high school this year, and we are so happy for her. She's absolutely beautiful. She played sports in high school, but she chose not to go to a four-year college and do all that because she said, I have a career now. So the girl is a real entrepreneur. She yeah. she does hair, she does makeup, and she does photography. Mm -hmm. And she is like knocking it out of the park. Yeah. So um, we're very proud of Natalie, and we'll go to her graduation tonight. And also what they do in this little town called White Plains, Alabama, is they, they have a walkthrough. So when Natalie, went to kindergarten and went all through grade school in this area. They put them in their cap and gowns and they walk to all of the classes that they pass yeah, through. Yeah. And all the children are cheering for them. But what a witness yeah. um, to share, to say, I hope one day you're gonna be me. And then to collectively hold on all those memories, seeing your kindergarten teacher and your first grade teacher and your second grade teacher and hopefully the principal and people who know you and that's the the beauty of that formation in her education. I, so. think, it's, I think it's incredibly powerful and there's something to be said for as much education as possible if you're going to public schools to be done under one roof mm. because you grow up kindergarten you go through eighth grade you go through middle school if they were all under one roof you got to look at your teachers you, you know they know you when you were young now you're this age and for those graduates to walk through to see all those young kids, mm -hmm. you know, it's really saying we're all connected here. Yeah. We all know who one another is. We're wishing one another well. We know who you are. And it's almost like a sense like you could always come back home. And any success you have, remember where you came from yes. and where you're going. We need that sense. And I think it's a wonderful thing that White Plains educational system does. But Joy, we look forward again to having Patrick O'Hearn with us today continuing to share from this wonderful book, Parents of the Saints, The Hidden Heroes Behind Our Favorite Saints, and all the different hallmarks of the homes that these saints were raised in and how it impacted them, the sacraments, how it impacted these saints, solitude, suffering, the sanctity of human life. What are the hallmarks in our families? What are the touchstones for our children that they're seeing in us that we're conveying to them verbally or non-verbally in how we live our lives? It's a wonderful tool for discipleship. Patrick says, yes, a father and a mother who embrace the gospel message like the saintly parents featured in this book can transform the world one diaper at a time, mm. one prayer at a time, one conversation at a time. The domestic church is the first school of the saints. So let's remember that. And that's, that's our school for our children. It's my prayer that you will be inspired by these holy parents and fall more deeply in love with God and his church and be convinced that holiness is found in the home. Holiness is found in the home as much as in the cloister. Lots to learn here. Stay with us. Patrick O'Hearn will be sharing about parents of the saints, the hidden heroes behind our favorite saints. We'll be right back. Plenty more to come. Don't go away.
Welcome back. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and today our guest again is Patrick O'Hearn. He is a husband and a father and an editor at Tan Books, and he's the author of several books, including The Parents of the Saints, and this beautiful book is available at EWTNRC. Com. And Patrick, you were sharing, you know, in our show yesterday a little bit about all of the hallmarks that you had and you know, the seven hallmarks that you had. And, and tell our family what is your favorite and most meaningful hallmark that you set aside. So the most meaningful one is the one on suffering. And through my wife's two miscarriages, I've kind of, the saints spoke to me. And one story in particular stands out, and that was when uh, St. Uh, Zelie, when she lost her child, it was due to neglect by one of the, um, uh, they had like a, breast, she was being breastfed by one of the, it was like a midwife, because mm -hmm. she had um, difficulty breastfeeding. And so when that child died due to neglect, Zelie, she experienced post-traumatic stress, and she, mm -hmm. she couldn't walk by the house where she lost her mm -hmm. child. And so that really, that, that spoke to me um, in, in regards, yes. you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did did they lose several children? They did. I, thought, I know yeah. that some saint lost four. They lost four children, two boys, um, and then also two girls. Mm -hmm. It's so hard to persevere and have fortitude and to keep faith yeah. and to do it in a real way, suffering the grief from yeah. this and yet continuing to have faith in God. So you identify with that because of your own pregnancy losses yeah. in your family. Yeah, and I think too, like to struggle, a lot, a lot of Catholic couples struggle with infertility. And one story in there was um, Blessed Chiara's parents, and they prayed 11 years to get pregnant. It took them 11 years, and, and then they had this beautiful daughter, Chiara, and they raised her up. And then in her teenage years, she got bone cancer, and then she died. And and that was just, you know, can you imagine the, the heart, mm. heartbreak for that, for the, to wait that long to pray, and then you get the child, and then it, and then it, and then it dies. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, the, you know, those are, those are the incidents and, and the events in life where you can't comprehend it. Yeah. And I, for me, and when we have experienced those kind of difficult things, it goes into the mystery box. I just say, I don't, I don't understand. Yeah. I don't have to have an answer, but Jesus, I trust in you. And so when you walk through trials and you walk through sufferings and losses, um, it, it affects us, right? Mm -hmm. But here are some saints, and, and back then it was common. Like if you had eight children, you were grateful if half of them lived, right, to the age of mm -hmm. five, just because they didn't have the medical community that we have right now. And there was, there's always so much suffering. But it's what we do with our suffering that is the transforming power that God wants to be at work in us. And you notice that in the saints. I did. You know, that suffering, it gave the witness, you know, as, as I mentioned before with uh, John Paul II's father, you know, to see his father embrace the cross. And, and we saw that later in, in John Paul II's pontificate, just how he was, you know, so frail and old. And, and he just kept going and kept offering that up. And there's a beautiful quote in there too I have from Mother Angelica. She's like, if I could just live one more day, you know, put all the tubes in me to keep me going so I can offer one more chance to love God more and to suffer more. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love your sharing about John Paul II's father, who was a military man, lost his wife at an early age, she dying in her 40s, losing a son who was a physician, a doctor, a wonderful guy, he dies. And John Paul II witnessing his father going through the suffering and pain. And as you said, such a devoted man, almost like a monk, you know, praying at certain times, down on his knees, various times during the night. John Paul looking at this. The father would push his bed close to John Paul when he slept at night. In the morning, they go to Mass every day, right? I think it was right across the street. John Paul would serve at that Mass. The father would be there. And uh, you, you speak about his discipline, his austerity, the father yeah. uh, of John Paul II. And uh, it wasn't just because of his suffering. It was really a decision in that way of discipline. And what that meant to John Paul II in terms of his leading a disciplined, mm -hmm. sacrificial life. And you note uh, in the sharing, which is something I didn't know, you say that John Paul II, not you know, in a regular way, sometimes at the Vatican, as the Pope, would sleep on the floor, the hard floor. Uh, 
and you think it's part of this witness of his, of his father and his rigor and his, mm -hmm. his asceticism, so to speak, and he would do that. And at the end, you recall in your book um, that John Paul, in terms of his, he's speaking about his last will and testament, I guess, and he says, uh, you could say it better than I do. There's nothing for you to take care of. It could just, it, there's nothing there. How, what are the words there? Because it's really, cause, and you think it was his father's insp inspiration again. Yeah, he, he said like, a, I almost, he bequeathed, <laughs> I, often, I forgot myself, but it's like yeah. I, he pretty much left nothing. He's right. like, I have no, you know, all, all, everything that I have, I, I leave to the church. And he, I think it was a picture of his parents that was alongside his, his bed. That was like his only possession. Mm -hmm that he had yeah. left. Yeah, and I think uh, it was either in your book or in another book, he did have some writings and stuff. I think he wanted them, maybe it was his own personal journal, I think it was, and he wanted that burned or something, he didn't want it, but they mm -hmm. didn't fulfill that wish, I think. Mm -hmm. I think they held on to that. So you have this hallmark, and we're speaking about the saints and the influence of parents on the mm -hmm. saints and the context in which they are raised. It's so important for us to think about as parents, because some of the th things we see as positive, some are so negative. Um, but it seems to me like the, the suffering and sacrificial is really linked as well with the sanctity of the person. So that's another hallmark, right? The sacredness of life, the sanctity of the person. Where do you go with that in the book? What elements are there when you're speaking about the sanctity of human life that you see in the parents that affects the saints? You know, one common thing I noticed that most of the saints came from large families. So as we mentioned, in, in those large families, you're going to have a lot of child loss when you're open to life. And it was, you know, you have St. Um, Catherine of Siena. She was one of, I think, I believe 25 mm -hmm. children. And she lost one of her, her twin sisters, uh, her twin sister. And, and I, I would say that that twin sister was like an intercessor, that she was kind of instrumental in her becoming a mm -hmm. saint. Mm -hmm. and, and then there's other stories, um, you know, in, the, in terms of the sanctity of life. Uh, so. Yeah. Yeah. Now, why don't you tell our family some of the mistakes that, because we all feel, I mean, I mean, even, you know, you look back, we've raised our children, we made a lot of mistakes. And we would always say. Yes, you could always ask your children <laughs> if no. they're alive. No, I mean, and I would knew I was yeah. making a mistake as we were going along. It's like, I probably didn't do that really well. You know, we could have done that better. I could have said that better. I could have responded more in kind. Um, but what were some of the, sa the saints, the mistakes that they sure. made, their parents? Yeah. Uh, I'll have like two of them. Saint, first of all, St. Teresa of Avila, her mother loved romance novels, and somehow those novels got into uh, St. Teresa of Avila's possessions. Her parents weren't really watching it, and it, St. Teresa and her biographies, it, it said it cooled like the flames of, you know, of her, pa you know, as far as her, her devotion, mm -hmm. she became more secular. Mm -hmm. She also had a cousin that was very, pretty, pretty evil, and she would come over and influence her. And again, her parents kind of were oblivious to that. So they didn't know who her friends were and also what she was reading. Mm -hmm. And another um, issue that I read was with, so St. Therese, I talk about St. Therese's grandmother. So because since her mother is a saint, so you can talk about St. Right. Zelie's mother. And St. Right. Zelie's mother's name was Luis. And Luis was um, more like a military sergeant. She wasn't very tender at all. Mm -hmm. and, and Zelie said she suffered because she was very sensitive. And she said her mother wouldn't even let her have a doll. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that impacted her. And thankfully, Zelie was married a sensitive man in, in Louis Martin. And the way she parented her children, as we know, St. Therese was very sensitive. Mm -hmm. So I think she learned her lesson. And she, she, was, she raised her kids in an atmosphere of love mm -hmm. and tenderness. Yes. Well, and that's the beauty of the life journey, right? So maybe if we didn't have perfect parents, and that also can be a teaching lesson for us to say, you know what, they weren't very healthy in their relationships or maybe they did this and that, and I don't want to do that. So that's what they teach us, right? To say, so when I become a mother or a wife, I'm going to do it differently because I learned the negative side of that and then we turn it into a positive and hopefully a holy and pure thing, right? In the, in the way that you have to look at it and say, Am I doing what's best for you? And examine our own lives. Yeah, yeah you, you definitely, you run with it. You, you pick the good things your parents do and then the bad things you avoid. And, and we also, a lot, a lot of people live in, uh, they're, they're kind of bitter towards their parents. And I think it's, you know, that fourth command, we got to honor them, honor our father and mother and just pray to God, like, Lord, help me just to be the best parents 
you know, almost in a sense, help me to be the best parents that I always wanted to have, even yeah. though maybe I didn't have them, but help me to be the best parents. Speaking about failings, you have the sacramental life, all of the sacraments, how that was working its way out in the parents, in the saints. And I thought your, your sharings about the saints and parents in the area of confession was just really good and really powerful. You share about um, some of the parents of, of the saints, and I don't know which, which is which, I just remember, that they would put them up on their knee, these who would become saints, and instruct them in what confession was about and reconciliation and what this means and how you go to confession and what takes place. I thought, how many of us do that? I mean, mm. with, with our children, with our grandchildren, to speak to them about this is how you prepare yourself for confession. You speak about the importance of regular times. You know, it seems like the saints set this and good parents set this for the whole family to go to confession, right? Those principles are really important as then so now those principles and one of the one of the um, saints parents spoke about after she instructed her when this saint would go to confession that the mother would uh, either she wept or the, the child wept because she knew that the child has such little sins but she was so earnest and serious about mm. it I mean if we had that in our homes that that love for confession for reconciliation for penance what a wonder that would be today. Yeah, you were referring to St. Gemma's parents and, and, and her mother also died young and but she would schedule them. It was every Saturday she would schedule confession with her children and when she couldn't make it because she, she had health issues she'd have her neighbor take them and even um, so it was definitely it was important you know it's like we schedule you know our car appointments mm -hmm. all these other appointments doctor's appointments but we need to go to the divine physician and that's what they did and also the importance of spiritual direction and, and you see that in Lewis and Zelie Martin you know they would meet with a priest and, and, mm -hmm. and help them and, and they were able to guide them yeah. and then which enabled them to in turn guide their families yeah. mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes as parents, even in the Catholic Church and in Catholic schooling, we leave it to the catechists, you know? But how beautiful it is to have that formation come from your mother or your grandmother or your father, you know, and say, This is what I say. This is this is the worst of me, right? And you can and then the children are looking like that's such a beautiful thing. And sometimes, you know, there are whole families that over oh, here at EW ten go to confession. And it is, it's so beautiful to behold, to say that I'm training you up so that you can work out your salvation with fear and trembling, and we all need Jesus, and that they catch that and know the power of all the sacraments. And, and, and I think it, it says to children, wh whether it's that solitude prayer and seeing the dad down on his knees or the mom, but especially the dad, I think, in terms of headship and, and leadership, or going to confession, you know, it says to the children, while well, I understand my father and mother are the leaders in this household, they bend the knee to Almighty God. Yeah. It's not a totalitarian kind of thing. Jesus is really head of this family. The church's teaching is really head here. And it gives children a feeling of security and safety that their parents are accountable. Is that one of the things you're trying to get through in these hallmarks and especially the sacraments of solitude and, and prayer? The headship of the home ultimately being under the head of Christ. Amen. Yeah, definitely the role of fathers and mothers, you know, and throughout the book, just highlighting the fact that prayer, you know, your body language says everything. And that's the reason why, you know, we have disbelief in the real presence. People, when they go to mass, maybe it's the way their parents pray. You know, they go through half, you know, half motions, uh, barely genuflecting. But when you go to mass and you see your mom and dad praying, like St. Saint, um, Saint Therese would often see her father in tears during mass when he would hear the gospel preached. And so that says everything. You know, we talk about, you know, body language, nonverbals. Uh, your, your example, your devotion is the greatest example. It may not be exactly what you say. That, 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 that has a huge part, but mostly that uh, example. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. beautiful. What we do. Well, we're going to hold you over for another segment. It's just so such a blessed yeah. book. Parents of the Saints, the Hidden Heroes Behind, Our Favorite Saints, the Hallmarks that were going on in those families at that time should be the hallmarks that we have today and maybe some other ones. But what are you passing on to your children generation to generation to generation to generation that all in your family might become saints? That's our goal. If we're not aiming at that, will we hit it? Aim at nothing, you're sure to hit it. 
we're aiming at sainthood. We'll be right back. Plenty more to come. Don't go away. Welcome back. We're at home with Jim and Joy, and we're wrapping up our show today with Patrick O'Hearn going over his great book, The Parents of the Saints. So, Patrick, why don't you tell our family, you know, why you wrote this book? It took you three years. You did a lot of hard work, a lot of research, a lot of digging you had to go through. Why should they get this book and what the difference it's going to make in their life and family? Yeah. I think, you know, parents, we can make or break a civilization and there was a great quote um, in regards to uh, St. Andre Bassett, one of his contemporaries said that destinies are shaped at the knees of a mother. Mm -hmm. So as a father and mother, you know, our, our impact it spans not just now, but for future generations. So I, I want parents to get this book uh, also to relate to some of these parents. You know, often the lives of the saints, we kind of become too familiar with them. And when you're married, like read, I love reading the lives of you know, St. Francis and, and St. John the Cross but I want to also read about parents, and, and I feel like this book will, will give you some practical advice through the seven hallmarks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I tell you, as I grow you know, over the years, communion of saints was something that I wasn't all that familiar with, but I was just praying to the Lord the other day, I'm saying, you know what, I mean, I have friendships, and some of my best friends have passed away, and things change, and so on, and I said, I'm really leaning on the communion of the saints, like I've never leaned before, because I understand they're alive, they're really alive, and your book helps us to really get down into the life, into the mud, into the joy of people's lives, and I feel like I know those saints better, and I really do believe I'm being empowered to live the life that I need to be living with their assistance and with their aid. So that you really do that in this book and it really does come across. Implementing this, you know, all those, those hallmarks, again, yeah. sacramental life, surrender, sacrificial love, suffering, simplicity, solitude, and I don't know what the last one was, but I have surrender again. But anyway, the seven hallmarks. Do you think that's something that, that we need to look at as parents and say, where are we hitting on these hallmarks? Mm -hmm. What are these hallmarks? Are we doing this here? Or maybe there's one that's more accentuated than another one. Or maybe we would have a different heading. You mentioned you were thinking maybe the heading of humility for another hallmark. But what are we, what are we doing here and forming them? And what difference does that make? You mentioned something about succession, generation to generation. Yeah. Is there a hallmark on our family, on our family line that we have here? Yeah. No, I I was mentioning the idea that I think God wants uh, saintly succession. You know how we have an apostolic succession, mm -hmm. you know, the traces back to St. Peter, and he wants saintly succession. You see in these families, like St. Therese's parents, her grandparents were holy, then it came to Zelie and Louis Martin, then it came to Therese. And so it's really important, this idea, this notion of saintly succession, our virtues, and as, as we know in our world, our vices are passed on. Mm -hmm. um, we see, you know, generational sins. And the antidote is holiness. This is what it's, it's passed on to our children. And you've said, <clears throat> holiness is passed on in the domestic church. Holiness is passed on in the home. Assured is passed on in a cloister or in a monastery. And that's a prophetic word for this yeah. time. I just think, you know, the culture is just so downplaying marriage. And even in the church, we're saying, well, I guess anybody who's significant in the way of holiness must be a religious order person. Just speak that final word to us in the importance of marriage. Take the risk, take the chance. So many aren't yeah. marrying today. They're afraid to marry. Yeah. Just the vocation of marriage. Yeah. Yeah. Marriage, I mean, even I, I grew up with that, that lie. I had to fight that lie that marriage is a second-rate vocation. And part of, part of my reason for writing this book is, okay, Lord, if, if I'm called to this, I want to see who these, who these incredible parents are. And after I discover their lives, I realize these parents, I would even argue after reading this, these parents were even holier than some of their children. Mm -hmm. And when we get to heaven, there's going to be a lot of surprises. And I think when you go up to Padre Pio or St. Louis de Montfort, St. Je Gemma, they're going to say, I want you to meet my parents. Mm, beautiful. Patrick, thank you so much for all of your writing and your books and for this particular book, Parents of the Saints, The Hidden Heroes Behind Our Favorite Saints. 
So be sure to pick this up, EW10RC.com, and let us do our part as parents to hit on these hallmarks that we shared today. Surrender and sacrifice and solitude and the sacramental life. If, if our children would really believe in the sacraments, would they ever leave the church? If we would love the Lord in the Most Holy Eucharist and the way of confession, and just live our lives as we should and they would see it, what a difference it would make generation to generation to generation. You're an important part of the CWTN family. You're never alone. You're always at home with Jim and with Joy. Bye now. <laughs>